Welcome, everybody, to another Inside Line podcast with your host, Dr. Daniel Cameron. In tonight's episode, Dr. Cameron will be discussing the case of a 64 year old woman with central nervous system involvement of the brain. The case was first described by Mahalan and colleagues in a paper entitled Central Nervous System Involvement of Anaplasmosis. Good evening, Dr. Cameron. And good evening, Darlene. Thank you for joining us. This, we, we, don't, we haven't spoken much um, on any of the podcasts. We haven't written much in the blogs about anaplasmosis. So this is an interesting topic. Yeah, anaplasmosis, um, you know, we always think of it as a systemic infection, but within a week to 10 days, you get better. But with any of these infections, uh, it can be more complicated. Now, anaplasmosis is interesting because it used to be called Ehrlichia, uh, the HGE, which means that that organism hits the granulocytes. The other Ehrlichia is called HME, where it hits monocytes. And uh, so over time, they just changed the name for this type to anaplasmosis. But sometimes when you order a test, it'll be listed as Ehrlichia. So, uh, so this this involved a 64 year old woman who was hospitalized. Can you tell us a little bit little bit about the background of the case and her symptoms? Well, she presented with a you know history of confusion and lethargy, but it was only for a day. But the next day, she had more lethargy, uh, subjective fever. At least that's what she felt: a little headache, nausea, vomiting, and increased confusion. So. What's important on a physical exam, not only was she having uh, confusion, she was also having aphasia and memory lapse for the previous 24 hours. So that's a concern when, uh, if they can't speak right, can't remember much, and you're only 64, to try to find some kind of illness. And what's more is the doctors were able to find an engorged tick behind the knee. Now an engorged tick's interesting because once that tick's been on for a day or day and a half, it starts filling up with blood. And we know that if it's an engorged tick, that there's a greater chance that something in that tick is going to get you. And in this case, the fact that you had lethargy, headaches, all kinds of systemic symptoms, aphasia and memory lapse, makes us worry that there's something going on with the nervous system. And in fact, her system, her symptoms have worsened pretty quickly, right over 24 hours, overnight. Right. And uh, with that increase uh, in such a short time, they ordered an MRI of the brain. And with the MRI of the brain, you know, lots of times with Lyme, the MRI doesn't show that much. Maybe it might show some white spots, you know, where the myelin is a little off. But this one showed a leptomeningeal enhancement. Now, leptomeningeal are the outer layers that cover the brain and a spinal cord. Since this was inflamed, that shows something's going on in the central nervous system. Now, it's not something I see very often. Uh, And uh, when they're sick like that, lots of times they're sick enough to go to the hospital and uh, which is the case in, for this woman. Now, the causes of liptomeningeal uh, can be almost anything. You know, bacteria, fungal, and virus covers almost everything, but it also shows up in autoimmune disease and even inflammatory diseases like sarcoidosis, vasculitis, cancer. And with so many different causes, it's still important to get to the bottom of what's causing this inflammation. And finally, not only was the leptomeningeal enhancement, but the subarachnoid area had, was hemorrhaging. And with what's called SAH, uh, now you have two findings, leptomeningeal enhancement and a subarachnoid hemorrhage. And uh, the, the doctors went on to try to find out uh, what the answer was. So uh, they tested for 
anaplasmosis, which was positive by PCR, but did they do a spinal tap as well or? Yeah, it, it, they, um, they did a spinal tap, but it didn't appear as if they tested for anaplasmosis in the spinal fluid. So they weren't completely sure that the anaplasmosis crossed into the brain. Uh, and that's important because um, with any kind of research uh, and clinical, you'd like to have some evidence of uh, a tick-borne infection in the brain. Now we're running into troubles with Lyme disease because you know, there's a study that says only one out of 10 had an abnormal spinal tap for Lyme disease, at least neurologic Lyme. And so we don't really have a lot of information how often uh, anaplasmosis shows up in the spinal fluid. You know, what was interesting about this is um, the authors point out that the transmission time from infection to symptom onset is as little as 24 hours. That's that's not seen in many of the tick-borne illnesses, is it? Yeah, most of the attention is given to Lyme disease uh, by the CDC. So they did a study saying that if you have a mouse, it might take 36 hours to 48 hours to uh, transmit the, an infection. Now, of course, I've had patients where they've had a tick for a shorter periods of time. But since that was research was based on a mouse, I'm not convinced that the 36 hour rule that you have to be infected for that long, or I mean, that tick has to be attached for that long is important. Now, because there are other things in a tick, each one has their own speed of how quickly it gets into the human body. Like the Powassan virus can get in there in minutes. And some of the other infections from a tick uh, can come in for a shorter time. And this author said that uh, within 24 hours, uh, that can get transmitted. But I should note that since this tick was already engorged, that means it was on over 24 hours anyway. Uh, some of those ticks are on two, three, four days. The authors didn't say how engorged that was. And, uh, but I, I suspect that uh, given this tick was on that long, uh, almost anything could have gotten transmitted. Do you think they would have likely tested for anaplasmosis had she not had a tick bite? A lucky thing for, to happen on this, you know, to always have, be able to document a tick bite. Well, I, I've been concerned because it's so easy to have jumped on to uh, the meningitis, uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage and gone off on another path by having that tick that was engorged behind the knee, uh, it certainly has supported testing for, uh, for tick-borne. Uh, they probably went further with tick-borne illness uh, than they would otherwise, you know, because lots of times you'll see a doctor only order a Lyme disease test. They might not order anaplasmosis, uh, Babesia, Ehrlichia. So it was fortunate. They, they might've tested anyway, but the tick certainly uh, reinforced the need for testing. So do you think the doctors are more apt to test for Lyme disease that's more over anaplasmosis? I mean, how, how um, educated do you think clinicians are about anaplasmosis? Yeah, exactly. I, I have plenty of emergency room physicians who will order not only Lyme, but all the co-infections. But often I'll see uh, you know, private practitioners or group practitioners who might order the Lyme disease test, but they just aren't ordering the, the broad range of tests. Uh, in this case, um, they were able to diagnose it uh, with a uh, PCR test. Now a PCR test, which is based on DNA, is seen in early disease. And this story was early. Uh, lots of times in practice, the PCR is already gone. So we can only rely on antibodies for some of the other infections. And even then, and the author said this, you can't always count on tests to be reliable, or at least not reliable in the first uh, uh, several weeks uh, with these kind of infections. So even though they found anaplasmosis and the other co-infections were negative, you know, I get a little nervous about whether there's an infection in that tick.
that uh, was overlooked. And now this woman was treated with doxycycline. I don't think it was clear how long they treated for. Um, you'll see a range of treatments from two weeks to uh, uh, four weeks. Uh, I like to do at least four weeks because I'm concerned that something else might be in the tick. I also uh, find that um, there's too many people that have uh, recurrent issues, recurrent problems, uh, that if I shorten the treatment too much is that they're in their back seeing me. I, I'm different than an emergency room that I ask people to come back and I expect them to come back, expect them to get reevaluated. So in this case, uh, they gave doxycycline and uh, she was um, improved with treatment. Until six weeks later, and then she had some symptoms reemerge. Yeah, that was a, an unexplained problem because six weeks after the doxycycline, uh, they had a headache. They, she came with a headache, word finding troubles, memory loss, and fatigue. And when they did MRI and MRA, you know, MRA is, shows the blood vessels, they found uh, that there was a, an increase in the intensities in the front parietal and uh, they also thought it was consistent with the, the hemorrhage um, in the middle cerebral artery division. Uh, or which, with, with those findings, normally I wouldn't want to get brave enough and just watch her. You know, they couldn't find any evidence of persistent anaplasmosis. They made a decision not to retreat. Uh, I don't think I would have been uh, likely to take a chance. Uh, I think in this kind of case with the worsening uh, symptoms and the MRI, MRA, uh, I would have uh, restarted doxycycline. I might have also looked a second time at whether there was a co-infection other than anaplasmosis, because as I mentioned earlier, some of these tests will come back positive mm -hmm. later on, and six weeks later would have been a time for some of the other co-infections to show up. So the authors are, uh, the authors noted that she had marked improvement and returned to her cognitive baseline three months later. So at that point, she was doing pretty well. Well, she must have had some issues because they did send her to speech therapy. And, uh, you know, I'm concerned with the uh, cognitive issues that lasted for a while. You know, I'm glad they cleared up, but uh, I find that over time, uh, patients who thought they were okay will show up a recurrence of issues later on. And they're not just some cognitive, but there's some significant, and there's all kinds of other issues that might pop up if you follow somebody over time. You know, like the fatigue, uh, headaches, poor concentration, lightheadedness, and, and on and on in some people. If it comes back and there's issues like that, I look a second time at whether there's a, a cord infection that might not show up in the blood test. And then I might adjust treatment if, uh, if they're still sick. Now, this case, the woman had a, so she had a brain hemorrhage, basically, right? It's an unusual hemorrhage in that, you know, normally if there's a big stroke, it's, you know, really involved the tissue of the brain. But a subarachnoid hemorrhage is more on the surface. And so it doesn't give you that severity of disease a complete hemorrhage does. That's why they call it subarachnoid hemorrhage, SAH. And that, uh, that's why it can be from an infection rather than just a vascular bleed, which uh, would have been devastating for her. Well, this is a hemorrhage of the, uh, just under the surface as opposed to in the tissue. Okay. And so it's a little different, you know, normally we always hear about hemorrhage uh, that there's hypertension where you break open a blood vessel or, or there's aneurysms where blood vessels uh, opens up, um, hypertension might cause it. And so they often end up uh, uh, perhaps uh, looking like a stroke, acting like a stroke and uh, maybe life threatening. So this one is more of a, um, a marker of a, some underlying problem. Now she, she had the, the neurologic involvement and that the authors point out that is actually more common in Lyme disease. Do you, would you agree with that or? Yeah, the uh, author has said that, you know, we often think of Lyme disease uh, and certainly um, there's 
quite a few people with neurologic Lyme disease. And so that's been reported. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, most of them do not have an abnormal spinal tap. They also mentioned in the article that Ehrlichia, remember I said, this is a type of Ehrlichia called anaplasmosis, mm -hmm. but Ehrlichia actually has these types of uh, leptomeningeal issues, uh, uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage issues. And so the authors felt that since anaplasmosis uh, hadn't really been discussed, that it was time to discuss that even anaplasmosis that we think is some people it's easy to treat can cause problems. Were these symptoms um, typical for anaplasmosis? Yeah, they, they were definitely consistent with anaplasmosis, uh, but what was extra was the uh, probably the aphasia and the MRA and MRI findings. You know, it's, it's pretty common when you're that sick and is that nowadays an MRA and an MRI are, are um, ordered. Now this one just happened to be abnormal and it said there was an underlying process. And a uh, couple with that tick, uh, she went ahead and got treated and uh, had a good outcome, which I'm happy for. How common is anaplasmosis and, and where, where do you find it? Well, uh, anaplasmosis in the Northeast United States where I practice is in ticks. And it's certainly not as common as Lyme. Even Babesia, which is a parasite, may be more common in a tick. But anaplasmosis is more common than the Ehrlichia. So that's why you'll see ERs ordering it because uh, anaplasmosis is you know, fairly common. Now, what's interesting is that vets have a test that's fairly reliable for anaplasmosis. So a uh, lot of times a vet will be ordering the anaplasmosis test. They'll be getting a positive anaplasmosis test. Um, I'm, I got the feeling that the test for the other tick-borne infections may not be as reliable. So you'll often see a, someone come home from uh, the vet uh, with anaplasmosis and their pet is taking doxycycline. What do you think we can learn from, from this case report? Well, I think when you have uh, someone that's like this, who's you know, 64, it's pretty easy to uh, assume it's a neurologic event from, uh, from something else. Uh, it's pretty easy to uh, get lost uh, in, uh, in some other diagnosis. But fortunately, the tick bite and, and this attentive uh, uh, physicians uh, uh, included anaplasmosis uh, were uh, aggressive with treatment and uh, she had a good outcome. So it's a, always a reminder that it's not just Lyme disease that gives neurologic uh, problems. Well, thank you so much for speaking about this case. And if anybody would like to learn a little bit more about it, they can read about it on your, on your blog um, at danielcameronmd.com. Thank you again for joining us. And we look forward to talking about the next case.